Friday nights, twitch.tv slash media. We start off with Down Ballot. Yours truly and the councilman go over the week that was in local news with an eye to the absurd. And of course, we tell you who needs to get their shit together. That's followed by Conspiracy Bingo, one of our funnest shows where we literally play bingo and watch conspiracy videos. And of course, I have a few drinks. Terrifying, but lots of fun. Again, Friday nights, stream starts 7.30 p.m. Pacific. Join us, twitch.tv slash echoplexmedia. Welcome podcast listeners and thanks uh, to the live listeners who are sticking around for the podcast portion of the show. This is the Plex. We do the show live every Sunday, 7 p.m. Pacific right here on Twitch. That's twitch.tv slash Echoplex Media. If you catch this on like Spotify or Apple Podcasts or whatever, you are getting one hour of what is often a five to six hour broadcast. You might want to watch live sometime. That is a 10 Eastern, 7 Pacific on Twitch. Or you can join our Patreon, patreon.com slash echoplex, five bucks a month. You get the audio and video capture of the show. 
You also get it a day early. You get it Monday instead of the Tuesday that we put out the podcast. And if you're crafty and you know how Twitch works, and if I don't end up DJing late into the night, you can actually get the whole show without paying for it. And you could also get the whole show without paying for it just by emailing us, echo at echoplexmedia.com, because we're not actually going to pay wall an MP3 or an MP4 because you don't give us $5. That's weird. Uh, other ways to support the show besides Patreon, though, you can find those at echoplexmedia.com slash support, or just go to our homepage, echoplexmedia.com, click the support us tab. You can find us all on Twitter. You can click the contact tab uh, on our website for all that. And um, I guess this is, in fact, what the people want. Police officers, they've gone insane. I don't hate the cops. And there's a person inside when the truncheon stops. Oh, don't aid the cops. Oh, when the raiders come, who will protect the shops? Don't aid the cops. They're a sensitive bunch. If you don't stop throwing your rocks, snap, crackle, pop. It's the sound of a taser. Your body drops. Don't aid the cops. Oh, don't aid the cops. Don't aid the cops. Oh, don't aid the cops. Like your local police Cause they don't do nothing wrong Like your local police Got rid of the corruption And the racism is gone They've been keeping the peace Keeping homeless folks out of the parks and malls Got a cure for your social disease Follow the law, don't hate the cops Follow the law, don't hate the cops Tennessee Lieutenant Governor Randy McNally, he's had a big week. He's had a very big week. What do you hope comes out of this? Well, I think I'll be a lot more careful about using social media. Amid a sudden uproar over his provocative social media interactions, Tennessee Lieutenant Governor Randy McNally sits down this afternoon to answer Phil Williams' questions about the controversy. Good evening, everyone. I'm Rory Johnston. Carrie's off tonight. Now, those social media interactions with a young gay model brought accusations of hypocrisy against the East Tennessee Republican and countercharges that he's become the victim of a left wing attack. Well, our chief investigative. <laughs> the left, you know what we did? We, in a lab, created the perfect twink for this man and put him on Instagram and made this man follow him. Reporter Phil Williams has covered McNally for more than 30 years, and he has the exclusive details with the man who says his posts reflect his evolving views on the LGBTQ community. I didn't used to like gay people until I saw one of them was hot. Like, what the fuck? Initially, I was not very kind to that community. 
He's like, and then I saw this what oh, was one guy, holy smokes, changed my whole outlook. As I learned some things and met some people in that community, back to a few things, I realized that they're still individuals and they still have value. In a legislative session dominated by bills outlawing drag shows in public places and targeting gender care for the trans community, Tennessee Lieutenant Governor Randy McNally finds himself facing accusations of hypocrisy after a progressive site unearthed his social media interactions with a 20-year-old gay model, among them provocative posts that were liked by the 79-year-old Republican, including one where the young man doesn't appear to be wearing clothes. When people see these posts, what should they take away from them? Well, I I'm like a big old heart on. I know that they should take away a, a whole lot. In an exclusive interview, McNally described how he befriended the young man first on Facebook, then on Instagram. Among the posts, this close up of the young man's backside, McNally responded with three red hearts and three on fire emojis, along with a comment Finn, you can turn. Oh my God. Your Rainbows and sunshine. <laughs> so again, I didn't, I didn't get too much into this uh, this week. I kind of knew it was going on, but I, I saw this interview and I'm like, nope, can't watch that until the show. It's just that you know, I, I, uh, you know, try to encourage people with posts and try to. Um, I was just trying to be encouraging. You know, help them uh if i can were you trying to help this young man in some sort of way uh just basically trying to encourage him there was also this post where the man said he was quote not a whore but a hoe one is a slut the other is a prostitute adding i'm the one that gets free weed for giving <laughs> to a sexual act and it was liked by lieutenant governor mcnally yeah i don't know that you know, a lot of times on people's posts, you see the name and you see what they've written and you just press the button that says like. So, so, so you didn't read uh, that post? I don't recall reading the part about the, the uh, weed, I know that. Well, what about the prostitute? I might have, I might have read that. That's not better. I, wait, like whatever. Was it appropriate to, to like the comment? Probably not. Probably not. Then we came to a moment in our interview that could not be avoided. I need to ask the question that people are suggesting on social media to, to let you respond to it. Have you ever had any personal relationship with this young man? No. You've never met him in person? No. Never have. The answer, the next obvious question is, do you want to? In fact, we found other LGBTQ related posts liked by Tennessee's Lieutenant Governor, who says he's gotten to know members of that community, including some from his own family, and that he's tried to be more affirming of their identities. He also notes that he has spoken out against some legislation pushed by his Republican colleagues. Does this affect your ability to lead? I hope not. And I've had some uh, colleagues say that they're supportive, both Republican and Democrat. And uh, I, I'm really, really sorry if I've embarrassed my family, embarrassed my friends, embarrassed the, any, any of the members of the legislature with the post. It was not my intent to and not my intent to hurt them. Roll call, Mr. Clerk. In the end, the Tennessee Senate chooses the Lieutenant Governor, a title that senators can also take away. Have you thought about resigning? I think that's really up to the members of the, uh, the Senate. Uh, you know, I would, I would serve at their pleasure and it, it would be up there my boss. Phil Williams, News Channel 5 Investigates. There is no doubt that Lieutenant Governor McNally is extremely active on social media, often offering positive comments about people's families, latest achievements, as well as birthdays and anniversaries. He tells Phil if there's any lesson for him, he needs to be a lot more careful with what he posts and how those posts might be perceived. <laughs> yo, yo, just don't be like, 
don't be horny on Maine. Like, I thought we all knew that. Like, if you're like some kind of person who's got some kind of like fucking public platform, and this guy wasn't just horny on Maine. I think that was like, it says Lieutenant Governor and then his last name on it. I think that's like horny on official, which is even like, that's even like, that's a step beyond horny on Maine. That's like horny on my official account as the, uh, as the Lieutenant Governor. This would be inappropriate, I think, for a person who is, uh, strong supporter of LGBTQ rights and somebody maybe more age appropriate for the kinds of people that they were interacting with. I think this would still be inappropriate. In fact, if this was a Democrat, a Democrat in their late twenties or early thirties, I think the Republicans would be all over this. And this is every, and that's like changing the scenario in a way to like make it less bad, but everything about this is bad. This dude's like 80. And those people were teenagers, people in their early 20s. Like they were of legal, they were legal age, whatever, but that's fucking neither here nor there. That shit's creepy. And he was doing it on his account that said that he's the lieutenant governor of Tennessee. That guy's a dumb fuck. And they said the question that's on everyone's mind was, have you met this young man? No, that's not the question on everyone's young mind is, have you been in the closet this whole time? And that's a valid question. And then like you go with them. Why are you voting for all these things that are anti LGBTQ plus rights when you are in fact part of that community? Like that's the question. Not a, not have you met this person? Although if he's like, well, we did have lunch a couple times, that'd be pretty fucking juicy too. Wouldn't it? My God, what an absolute fucking idiot. Just make a fake account for fuck's sake. <clears throat> Anyway, we're going to move on. Um, I don't know if this is less stupid. It's just stupid in a very different kind of way. So there was a, um, there's a story that the, the, the right wing media is trying to make a big deal out of. There was, um, two Americans were abducted in, uh, Mexico. Um, and two people are, uh, I think, I'm sorry, four people were abducted. Two were found dead and two were, uh, rescued or let go. And uh, the right is making this big push about this being about border safety. But this happened on the Mexican side of the border. This didn't happen like at the border or anything. This happened in Mexico. It's bad. You shouldn't go to another country and get fucking abducted. That's terrifying. Um, and two of them died. That's murder. And there should be there should be some, you know, this is an international incident. It should be one, but not in the way these people are talking about. And here comes the five. They have the solution. Actually, check this out. In 2019, remember the Mormon family, nine of them, including little babies, yeah. slaughtered mm -hmm. in the Mexican side of the border yep. during the Trump administration. The United States did not take military action. You can't take military action. It's not the days of the imperialists. Overall, though, if you're not, not about this family, but about the 100,000 that are dying from fentanyl. Think it's a horrible, that. horrible situation, but you have to have the Mexican government working with you. I think the well, way to threaten the, the way that you can, no, you, you can. cannot, you cannot. I agree with you. Garcia Luna, the guy who is the J. Edgar Hoover of Mexico, the head of the judicial branch of the government, uh, you know, went down a life facing life imprisonment. Uh, El Chapo's cartel dealing, uh, dealing drugs, getting huge payoffs. But you've got to get the Mex if you attack Mexico, the Mexican government or the Mexican people will rise up against you. The better idea, I think, is to use trade, squeeze as Trump at, at times did. He used it effectively in terms of immigration. But I think you've really got to make it clear to the Mexican people that it is in their vested interest to do the best they can to, to provide information to honest cops. But military but has difficult. to be on the table, Geraldo. The, uh, Why does it have to? No, we're not. But, 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 but Mexico's our friend. U.S. military? Yes. Put it on the table. The history of imperialism in Latin America runs very but deep. And uh, I, uh, to use the military against a Latin American country would be virtually impossible. We did it, it in Colombia. It would be like with the Colombian consent in a civil war that had divided the country. I was there. I was in Colombia with U.S. forces in the Colombian jungle. And still not doing cocaine? 
<laughs> never, never. Oh, okay. I don't never. Oh, he's lying. Geraldo's. I don't know if he did it when he was in cocaine. When he was in Colombia, but Geraldo, Geraldo done cocaine. Uh, <laughs> vir- vir- virtually never. Virtually never. Virtually never. Okay. Well, fucking, you gotta, you gotta admire the man's honesty. He's like virtually never. It, it, it's almost like it's it's not really an either or thing. I mean, what we're talking about is trying to make the cost of doing business nearly impossible. Right. So well, that is like, there's no risk for them to do this. We need to create a risk, and the only way you can do that is threat of death. Whoa. I agree. Yeah. Threat of like basically, he means slaughtering civilians. If we invade Mexico, ain't shit gonna happen to the cartels. Fucking Mexican people are going to die. My God. Why are they? Why are, why are people like, we need to invade Mexico? Like, people go to other countries and get um, kidnapped all the time. It's fucked up. But people from other countries come to America and get kidnapped or uh, assaulted, murdered. It happens. And other countries aren't like saber rattling on us. But then after they were like, oh, the military has to be on the table, then they were like, what? This is, uh, uh, what? And then they're like, oh, you know, because of fentanyl. And this the answer should still be like, uh, what? Like, I'd like to see some hard numbers on where uh, the fentanyl in this country is coming from. I'm skeptical that it's coming across the border in sort of the stereotypical way people think drugs come across the border. I could be wrong, but I'm skeptical. I'm skeptical. Speaking of things I am skeptical of, there are two people who I am skeptical of in this next clip. This is Andrew Yang and Marianne Williamson um, seem to be suggesting that a Democrat shouldn't be prioritizing black voters because it will disenfranchise a uh, racist. Um, Marianne Williamson has every right to run for president. I don't think that there should be any effort to push her out of the race. I also believe that if she meets the criteria that would have gotten someone into the debates in 2020, that the Democrats should host debates and invite her to the debates. Uh, but I don't think that's going to happen. And I think that any goodwill that I might have had towards her is uh, going to be eaten up pretty quickly if she keeps going on with people like Andrew Yang. And uh, here's uh, three and a half minutes or so of their discussion where they, well, you know, Andrew Yang's never been real good on race, so it's going to be what it's going to be. So one of the dynamics I think that's used to justify uh, having South Carolina first and uh, New Hampshire and Iowa not um, is that South Carolina is more diverse uh, New Hampshire is predominantly white. Iowa is predominantly white. And there, there's an argument that that's not representative of the country. It's not representative of the Democratic Party. But one of the things that pains me about is that it accelerates or increases the polarization uh, between the two parties, where if you say to certain types of voters, it's like, well, you know, sorry, rural white Midwesterners, not a priority for the Democratic Party anymore. We're going to go to diversifying areas. And then the people that are in those states still, including the whatever it is, 40 uh, you know, one percent of Iowans who are still Democrats are looking up saying, wait a minute, like what, what just happened? In addition to everything else, it's stupid. You know, when uh, Lyndon Johnson signed civil rights legislation, he said we just lost the South for a generation. He didn't say we just lost it for 50 years. He said we lost it for a generation. And when the Democratic Party in just the way that you said, just kind of blew off the South, that was ridiculous. You don't just give ground like that. And now you're talking about giving ground in certain rural states, et cetera. The Democratic Party should be standing for rural America. The Democratic Party should be standing for Southern America, for, um, uh, the American South. And, and the problems, the deepest problems in the rural communities as well as in the American South are economic problems. The Democratic Party needs to return to its traditional value of unabashed advocacy for the working people of the United States, not just the managerial elite. I mean, it's, it's stupid on top of everything else, but it's also a, 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 a swing away from the principles on which we purport to stand. You know, it's also very dangerous because Franklin Roosevelt said that we would not have to worry about a fascist or authoritarian takeover as long as democracy delivered on its blessings. So here is the DNC and the Democratic elite who say to someone like me, you can't do this, you shouldn't do this because somebody primarying Biden, you know, all this, it's so big on if we primary Biden. Last time that happened, Jimmy Carter lost. 
what, Ronald Reagan had nothing to do with that? You're going to blame the whole thing on Teddy Kennedy? But more importantly, the problem, if we have an authoritarian threat in our midst, which we do, the issue is not to suppress democracy. The issue is to use democracy. To so this started out talking about moving <clears throat> the, the first Democratic primary to a state that is, as they said, more representative of the Democratic Party just by its demographics. And she's trying to be like, oh, well, we need to focus on working class. Well, what do you think none of the fucking black folks are, are working class? Like, having the first primary in the South is smart. And somebody in chat was saying, I don't talk to chat too much during the, uh, during the show, but somebody in chat was saying, why wouldn't you move your primaries around every so often? It seems like a good idea. Stand for democracy, and that's why I'm saying that we should be offering to the American people the genuine economic reform, which would be the embodiment of a genuinely democratic agenda. I agree with you that the way to make us more resilient to authoritarianism that is a very real threat is more democracy, not less. Whether that's yeah, the exactly. primary, Democratic Party. Uh, and you know I've been championing things like nonpartisan primaries and ranked choice voting that I think would truly mm -hmm. open the system up. Uh, listen, we know that the Democrats and the Republicans have formed a very unholy alliance, w making it very, very difficult for anyone but them to even be in the conversation. That's true. But it's also true that the Democratic Party in its history has been a powerful, a powerful stand uh, for the working people of the United States, for the average American and the principles on which we stand. My heart leads me to work there, including, I know the efforts to invisibilize me, and uh, I think it would be much easier to do if I ran third party. So I'm uh, standing up for my nostalgic memories of what the Democratic Party once was and still can be. So like, moving the primary doesn't like change any of the democratic values it just moved the primary the primaries have been in like the first primaries have been in like those two mostly white states like i think my entire life or the entire time i've been voting and so like moving them around isn't it does you're not taking away anybody's vote by like making them not first anymore in the primary process i've always been of the opinion we should do the primary one fucking day honestly I'm just do it in one day let the best motherfucker win let's go baby I feel like it would be more fair to everybody. There'd be less horse trading, less of this bullshit that people don't like. But if we're going to have the primaries like staggered, yeah, we should be moving them. The Democratic Party should be the party most likely to change the order around to make different states first. Just for just for fun, they should do California first one time, right? Like then people in California would feel more enfranchised because by the time these things hit California, it's usually a the, the it's usually a foregone conclusion who's going to win. Put New York first sometime. Do Florida first just to piss off Ron DeSantis. Like, whatever. Like, move it around. I don't see, like, what the problem is here. But the implication there was that you're, that they moved it away and that they're going to, they're just not interested in the the plight of the working class in, in Ohio or whatever. And it's like, well, no, they just didn't put them first in the primary. I don't, I don't see the problem here. I, the only thing, the only, it leads me to believe that Andrew Yang thinks the white states should go first. Or the mostly white states. That's just what it leads me to believe. I don't know for sure. I don't know what's in that guy's mind. Um, also, not for nothing, he was talking about ranked choice voting and all this other stuff. What Forward did, by the way, in Nevada, they uh, after people had been working for fucking years in Nevada to try to get ranked choice voting in, Forward swooped in and fucking took credit for it. Like, they literally came in and took credit for it after people had been working on it for long since before the Forward Party even existed. I do not trust Andrew Yang. And to the extent that I have any goodwill towards Marianne Williamson, it's mostly because of what she did to Dave Rubin the last election cycle. And uh, she's going to throw that shit away if she starts associating with these fucking grifters. But, I mean, maybe that's the only place she can go. Who knows? I think the mainstream outlets, as long as she's uh, running, should give her a fair shake. And like I said, if she meets the requirements, she should. there should be, there should be uh, debates. I don't think she'll meet those requirements, but whatever. Let her, let her run. Everybody should have a chance to run. Anyway, here's uh, Fox is the Five talking about the origin of COVID-19. They take you. And so it brings you to that question that you just asked. Why? 
Why was he so invested that this was something that jumped from an animal without an intermediate host to humans? Why was that so important? Why was it so important that they shut down First Amendment discussion? Why was it so important that they shut down doctors who came up with the idea of hydroxychloroquine? Or, and I know people who took that. Or Joe Rogaine, well, ivermectin. But they didn't come up with the idea. None of these people came up with the idea of it. These drugs had been invented prior. They were suggesting them to people with no evidence or all that is horrible why are doctors in california uh, facing the loss of their licenses for even talking about hydroxychloroquine uh malpractice um fucking you these licensing boards you sign up for the licensing board and you like, like there's all kinds of clauses in these these medical licenses there's all kinds of clauses for all kinds of professional organizations these are generally private organizations that that sanction uh, doctors that are taking away the sanctioning and then uh, the state licensing board probably uses these what these private organizations are doing to um, decide whether or not these people are licensed to practice medicine this is what if the doctor's going out there talking about bloodletting be like oh you're you have covid uh, just let all the blood out of your body oh you have covid what if we what if there was, you know, there were doctors out there telling people to drink, what is it, MMS, that miracle mineral solution, which was a uh, diluted uh, industrial bleach? Yeah, those people should lose their fucking license. Fuck out of here. That's not, you don't have a right, you don't have a right to a medical license. That's not a First Amendment issue. Anyway, here's Fox's The Five talking more about the origin of COVID. Jessica, why did they need it to be about the wet market? Why did it have to be about that? Was it because they could, it couldn't be about it? Did it have to be about the wet market? Else? Or did they, were they, I mean, were so invested in this idea, they couldn't let go? Well, it was a feasible explanation and remains one, right? So we have low confidence from the Department of Energy and medium confidence oh, from stop. the FBI. Uh, but there are multiple theories. You're stop. being disingenuous then if Everybody you say that it's it not possible. from the lab. Okay. The reason that I think it also matters is the bioweapon discussion, because mm -hmm. people went right to that, that China was trying to take us all out. And that's obviously a very serious accusation to make and very different from they were doing virology research in a virology lab. We do gain of function research there, which happens all over the world. And other Western democracies also participate in that. Everyone's making it out as if Dr. Fauci, you know, stood around by himself and said, like, we oh, I want to make we something. We don't do it here. We offshored it. Well, I don't think that dangerous. it matters. Okay. <laughs> to the point, though, about the fact that, like, the NBCs of the world or the main, the MSM, whatever you want to call it, Jesse, won't do an about face. I, NBC was the one that authored the study about, or the article that blew up about how natural immunity was more effective than the vaccine. That was just a couple weeks ago. I do think the conversation has shifted, but it, it is natural that people don't want to take accountability. And I do think that's what these investigations are for. And we should welcome it. I think Fauci should answer all those investigations, but not feel like he's someone who has to, quote, pay the piper for what he's done. Oh, he's just that he should oh, have, well, should have to talk him. about... The idea that Fauci spun this or even wanted to have it happen so that he could get rich in his I retirement. I never said he wanted it. I'm just saying I think he got I really paid for it and covered it up. Really, we funded the investigation. No, but he I mean, funded that, the lab. Here's right. The thing. Why? That is to the, gain that, a function research oh. to help the vaccine companies. Yeah, that's fucking. That's just fucking straight up info war shit right there. <clears throat> we had a. Um, check out the intellectual dollar tree. We had Marcus uh, Homozygote on. He is. Uh, not a virologist, but he is a PhD candidate with re in a, re a relatively, you know, relevant area of study. And we talked about uh, <clears throat> the lab leak. And it the, the thing about this is that, like, the only thing that's really changed is that the the substack weirdos and all the fucking conspiracy theorists have managed to kind of hijack this conversation and take it away from uh, people who are virologists and infectious disease specialists, because the 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 consensus among relevant experts is still that this is very likely a zoonotic origin and it very likely came from the wet market. That's it. That's, it hasn't changed. That hasn't changed. And that's just the way it is. And I don't know why, why is everybody so desperate for it to be a lab leak? The, if, if the, if the scientific consensus hasn't changed and people are desperate for it to be a, that, that, that came out of a Chinese laboratory. I mean, I guess I, I mean, I have an idea why they they want to gin up hate and fear about China because these people are warmongers and they probably want fucking World War Three. 
and they're <clears throat> they don't want it with Russia. They want it with China. I don't want it with anybody. I think it'd be horrible to die in World War Three, or be even worse to live through it. My God. But none of this changed. Nothing changed. Everything's right about where it was when the lab leak discussion started. Everybody's going to like this. We're running way behind on time. So we're going to skip the entire Tucker Carlson segment. I figure we can get some, maybe some dancing crabs in the chat for that. Um, <clears throat> so every once in a while, somebody like there's going to be, a, there's a Republican every once in a while, a member of the GOP that, that surprises us a little bit. And in this case, it is a Missouri state legislator who is going to surprise us in a good way. There's a bill, one of these anti-queer bills going through the Missouri state legislature. And this, uh, this dude is clearly a Republican. Um, you can just look in the, you can look on the docket. The show notes will be in the, in the podcast. You can be able to find it, or you could, uh, exclamation point docket in the chat to get it. Uh, people, you know, figured out who this guy is. And, uh, you know, Every once in a while, we get a we get a bit of a surprise from uh, a level-headed person who's more conservative than we are, and uh, I'd like to highlight that here. I'm just going to read you the, the language in your bill. No classroom instruction by school personnel or third parties relating to sexual orientation or gender identity shall occur. Um, lady, you mentioned George Washington. Who is Martha Washington? His wife. Under your bill, how could you mention that in a classroom? So to me, that's not sexual orientation. Really? So it's only really certain sexual orientations that you want prohibited that, from introduction you, in the classroom. You have language to make that better, to make it where you're not talking. Lady, I didn't introduce your bill. Okay. Uh, <laughs> He just keeps calling. Oh, he's being hella condescending, too. I didn't write it. You wrote it. And so I'm asking what it means. Which sexual orientations do you believe should be prohibited from Missouri classrooms? We all have a moral compass. And my moral compass is compared with the Bible. Lady, I believe during your testimony... You said that you didn't want teachers' personal beliefs entering the classroom, but it seemed a lot like your personal belief you would like to enter all Missouri classrooms. You can, you can believe something without, in, without, in, without putting that onto somebody by the way you behave. And you can have beliefs and morals and values that guide you through life. I don't dispute that, but I'm asking about the language of your bill and how it would permit the mention of the historical figure, Martha Washington. Could you explain that to me? So what does she, why, why is she famous? Is she famous because she's married with, to George Washington? It seems like that would be a relevant fact. <laughs> seems like it would be relevant. <laughs> In her biography, yes. <clears throat> Could it be mentioned under the plain reading language of your bill? Is that a no? I, I, I don't know, sir. Okay. <laughs> Fuck yeah. So critical support to that guy. He's probably a ghoul in a bunch of other ways, right? That we probably wouldn't like him that much. You probably wouldn't vote for him yourself if, you, if he was your, maybe a representative for your area. But my God. My God, that was fantastic. So, yeah, we're going to we're skipping ahead a little bit here. Uh, Jim Baker has shown his ugly head. And I mean, ugly in the on the inside, of course, since nobody really cares what Jim Baker looks like. Um, and he is stunned. I tell you, stunned that people have been making fun of him for uh, hucking these buckets of slop on his show. He just found this out, apparently, is what which is funny to me because there was like. There was like a there was like a time where you could go on to just about any liberal or lefty uh, podcast or you know, a YouTube channel or Twitch channel or whatever that was running any kind of news clips at all, and Jim Baker was just all over it, making fun of 
People were making fun of his buckets of slop. People were ordering his buckets of slop to try the food on their shows. Like, it was a whole fucking thing. Vic Berger made great videos about it. They were funny. And so uh, it's interesting that uh, Jim Baker never, that never, he never caught wind of any of it. I don't go to social media. No. Not I, for I, him. No. I'm, I, I can use the excuse I'm too old to go there, but it's, it's, it's so bad. And so, but I, I just wanted to go. It's one of the biggest social media set, set up. So I heard, Mondo, that our show's on, on the, that, that particular website. So I wanted to see how our show's being handled over there. So I went over there, put in Jim Baker. And, oh, that's the mistake right there. And, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I try to teach them throughout the years. Never oh, Google yourself. Never but check on the, yourself the, because they lie. You get they make things the lie up. They in between my things. shows, it's horrible. It's evil. There's people who uh, can I say hate my guts. I mean, there are oh, people yeah. who oh, want yeah. to destroy <laughs> us. Oh yeah. And one of the keys, one of the biggest onslaughts, is this. One of the it is pretty funny. Made yes. Fun of me about is the food buckets. And I mean, I couldn't believe it. They have whole websites laughing, mocking, and and you cannot you can't allow that stuff in your spirit, though. That the but thing is, you can't. I, I'm just telling you. I believe it's satanic. It <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's fucking amazing. Oh, that's so good. I'm so glad he fucking showed back up. Just to be like, I, I'm fucking stunned, actually, that uh, people have been making fun of me for these buckets of slop. He's like, I saw a whole fucking video about it where they had music and sound effects. I hope he, like, laughed at some of it. All right, our next one. This is uh, Bree Joy Gray and uh, Matt Taibbi. Generally, nobody to root for here, but... Brie asked a pretty good question of Matt Taibbi here. ...has every interest in profiting from the organization, you know, et cetera, who is volunteering, selectively putting stuff out there for, for journalists to go through. Isn't that, isn't that a different scenario? Y yes, but but every every source has motives. Every, every every source that you ever work with ha has has motives, and you're always making a calculation every time you do any kind of report. Now, I've done probably a dozen whistleblower stories. Uh, they're all different. The sources all have different motivations. Some of them are are noble, like they 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 do things because morally they can't get um you know behind whatever it is that's going on at the company or or, or in the government sometimes people are just bitter uh because they've been passed over for a promotion or for money sure. or whatever it is it doesn't matter though ultimately it, 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 it please let me finish sure ultimately you're always weighing that versus whatever the newsworthiness uh, is of what you're looking at and what you're hearing about and you get the stuff and then you try to confirm whether it's true or not. And then as soon as you make that determination, that's when you go forward. I mean, like if I had any belief that there was some hidden trove of communications where there was this massive campaign against left-leaning people that, that I was somehow missing, that, that there were you know, uh, lists from the FBI that were targeting um, Democrats, for instance, like uh, that were being passed to people like the, the lawyer Stasha Cardiel or Yul Roth or whatever it was. If I thought for a second that there was a realistic chance of that being the case, um, I, yeah, of course I would stop doing this story. But, but, but the, 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 there's no evidence of that. It would, it would be so hard to pull off something like that without that being detected in the documents. So you, 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 you would have, you would be, you would see some indication. Like that's bullshit because <clears throat> like I was saying before, you're getting the documents from a fucking Elon Musk and he's giving you fucking documents that he wants to give you. And that's all you have. So <clears throat> yeah, you're not going to see evidence of a counter narrative. If he's going through that or he's having somebody go through that with a fine tooth comb to make sure that all that you're getting is the narrative that fucking apartheid Clyde wants to push. 
<clears throat> it's like really like not even journalism. That's fucking stenography. It's just public relations for a billionaire. And you'd think based on what Matt Taibbi used to pretend that he stood for or whatever, you'd think that maybe that wouldn't be a thing that he'd be interested in doing. But apparently, <clears throat> you know, and cozying up to a billionaire, I mean, it's tempting, right? We can see the temptation. I can't see how it wouldn't be tempting, even for a very moral person, <clears throat> a very ethical person, a very good journalist. It would still be tempting because there's money and power. And it's not just money. Being friends with Elon Musk gives you power. And so I could see where somebody would want that. It's just like you... you you done thrown away any good work you ever did. And Matt Taibbi, not for nothing, was a giant piece of shit all throughout. Like, basically, as soon as COVID hit, the guy started being a gigantic piece of shit. He was probably a piece of shit before. We just didn't know as much about it. Anyway, we're going to move on to the Daily Wire portion of the show. Uh, and I'm just going to ask, who is this person and why is it ben- why is it just Ben Shapiro? You want militant queers. You want people who disagree with you to be so afraid of you that they don't even dare speak, and you want to take children away from their parents. That is what I'm hearing here. This is who Hershey's decided to hire to represent and stand for women in Women's History Month and on International Women's Day. A biological man who transitioned and became an activist in order to make money and create some fake platform to feel good about himself because he hated himself so much that My he was God. a cisgender man. Advertising used to be about promoting a product, not an ideology, but here we are this is what Hershey is doing. This has nothing to do with chocolate whatsoever. Why are you even doing an International Women's Day campaign? I don't care. The only time I'm thinking about your products is when I am in the checkout line at Walmart and I see the cookies and cream one next to the cash register and then maybe I'll buy it. So, okay, so she's still going to buy Hershey products is what she's saying. Like, yo, what does she mean? Like, companies have always, as she would say, virtue signaled. Companies have always put up stuff about like uh, International Women's Day or a better example is Pride, right? Where all these companies change their logo to a rainbow during fucking during June. They've been doing it for a very long time. This isn't new. Companies will do this all the time because get this. If people think that your company is good. They're more likely to buy your product. And most people don't share the view of the Daily Wire when it comes to uh, women's issues, uh, trans issues, uh, gay and queer issues more broadly. And the people who do marketing for Hershey know that. And so they're just doing what they need to do as a business. They have a fiduciary responsibility to maximize return for their shareholders. And that's what they're doing. And these proponents of capitalism they fucking hate it. And I, I find that interesting. Here's uh, Matt Walsh uh, talking about the pride flag. It's going to be great. Now, let's not be coy about this. Yes, it, it should be expected that anything painted in the street will end up scuffed and tire marked. That should be expected. But also, yes... Clearly from the video, the tire marks on the Fort Lauderdale mural were put there on purpose. And this was an intentional act of vandalism. It wasn't. The guy was, the guy was, uh, was, was obviously doing that intentionally. You can tell that from the video. And to that, I say, okay. Now, I'm not endorsing the destruction of public property. I certainly am not encouraging anyone to engage in such behavior. I couldn't say that. But but what is it that the left said about the BLM rioters? You know, the the ones that that caused uh, quite a bit more uh, destruction of public property. Um, What was it? It was uh, they're speaking in the language of the unheard. No, that's not. That's what that's literally what Martin Luther King Jr. said about riots. Actually, that's not. That's not what we said here. What the Democrats said. That's. To the extent that anyone was saying it, they were quoting Martin Luther King Jr. when asked about rioting. Was it right? Well, here you go. I would say something similar in this case. 
Lots of unheard and powerless people are looking around at our country and noticing that this far left political symbol is being shoved in our faces everywhere we turn, including and especially by our, by our governing authorities. And it's being elevated to a place of greater importance and status than the American flag itself. And these people are disgusted by it and they're sick of it and they are beyond frustrated and they should be. Let's just put this plainly. The pride flag does not deserve our respect. In fact, it deserves our disrespect. It's it just a flag. It deserves our contempt and mockery. It is not the flag of gay people, okay? That's not what it is. Gay people in America, um, they already have a flag. It's called the American flag. It's the flag we all share or are supposed to share. Wait, what? Flag, that, tell that to your fucking fans who ha have the don't tread on me flag, dude. People can actually, come on, man. States have flags. Fucking sports teams have flags. Which was invented by a far left activist drag queen represents not a person or a people or a community, but an agenda, a political and cultural agenda. It always has. It has from the very beginning. It still does now. And today, nearly all of the most depraved and perverse attacks on children, on tradition, on decency, on common sense are waged under this banner. That's what it signifies. Okay, The gay pride flag signifies drag queens dancing for toddlers, uh, males invading women's bathrooms. It, it signifies castration drugs given to children. Oh, my God. No, no, no. Come on. Stop. When government officials send that thing up the flagpole or paint its ridiculous colors in the street, that is what they're promoting. It's what they're advertising. It is the cause they want us to salute. Not only should we, re should we refuse to salute it, but we should treat it with disdain. Is anybody asking you to salute the pride flag? Like all like a fucking Boy Scout is supposed to salute the American flag? I don't think anybody's out there fucking saluting the fucking pride flag. We should treat it as a hate symbol because that's what it is. No. They fly the flag, that flag, because they hate you and your vet. No, I'm fucking no. Why would we? No. Well, I mean, I fucking kind of hate Matt Walsh. But it's not because he's straight or even because he's conservative. It's because he's because of this shit. So, yeah, if that symbol, if that flag is a symbol of hate hatred toward people like Matt Walsh, people who would take away your rights and mine, then sure, then f fucking let that hate flag fly. But sir, we hate you because of your behavior. Values and what you believe and everything you stand for. And so we should respond in kind to this symbol. In other words, we should give the pride flag all of the respect that the left shows the American flag. Let's just put it that way. In the end, I kind of don't care to, cause it's just a flag, right? Like, like I it just, it's just a flag. But like the point here, isn't really about the flag. He just used this as an opportunity to re reiterate that he hates queer people. And that he thinks that queer people are out to get him. And I suppose most queer people are out to get Matt, but a fucking, it, you know, when you were a kid, you'd be like, well, you started it. Well, Matt, you started it. I hate to tell you this. You started it. So here's Michael Knowles. Um, just talking about a monarchy. The libs fear that if politicians believe in God, that's going to cause them to do all manner of terrible things. If you think that the God-fearing politicians are bad. Just wait until you see the politicians who don't fear God. This is, this is a way, it's a kind of obscured in the history now, but we all make fun of divine right monarchy as this sort of absurd idea, and it's the, we view divine right monarchs as being absolute tyrants wielding. But that isn't true. The idea of divine right monarchy is actually that there is a limit on the power of the monarch because the monarch is answerable to God who is a lot more important and powerful than a politician who is answerable only to the people or answerable only to a small group, say, in an oligarchy. 
This is the meaning of John Adams's famous statement, the Constitution is built for a moral and religious people. That's the constraint. When you take that constraint away in the name of the separation of church and state or the enlightened views of secularism, and when you take that away, you're going to lose the grace, you're going to lose the restraints, you're going to lose the kiss it up for vengeance is the Lord's, and you're going to get a lot of wrath and gluttony and pride and lust and all the rest of it. You're going to get a country burning to the ground, as we have seen in recent years. No, we haven't. They keep acting like the protests in 2020 that like just everybody's local fucking 7-Eleven and apartment complex in your neighborhood and fucking... No, like a very a very small number of buildings were set on fire. Some of the more famous ones, we have evidence that it was the Boog, the Boogaloo Boys. Boogaloo Boys are not your like three percenters or whatever. If you want to take a look into the Boogaloo Boys, you should. They are accelerationists. They will pretend kind of to get behind any cause if they think it will lead to a civil war or the destruction of the the state. And so there's good evidence that in Minneapolis, some of the fires were started by the Boogaloo Boys. Um, but there were not a significant number of fires. I bet of structure fires that happened that year, I bet the, the protests don't even really show up as a cause for structure fires in the, in the year 2020, they wouldn't even show up on a graph. Like if you did a pie chart, these people are just absolutely fucking living. I don't even think they believe this shit. I have no way of knowing. And I kind of don't care. Right. Like, I don't care if he believes that shit or not. He's he's the C team of Daily Wire, so he's not reaching millions of people. He's reaching maybe hundreds of thousands of people. That's still way more people than I'm able to reach, right? Oh, I don't know. In a good month, the intellectual Dollar Tree does pretty good, but we're not talking about this stuff on there. Um, I just don't. And that's like setting aside the part where he was like, actually, these monarchies, they were restrained because God. When was the last time you ever heard of God stopping a fucking king from doing something in that fucking history book? God reached down and be like, stop it, King George. No, God never did that shit. Those people used God as like a justification for their, their kleptocracy, for their own oligarchy, and for their autocracy, where to, to have power, you just have to be next in line in the family. And the peop- they were saying, oh, well, this is what God wants. They just used God as a fucking like a stand in for like a reason that they should have the power. That's not a reason to have power. I know very religious people who think that's a dumb reason for somebody to have power. Here's Michael Knowles at a talk he was giving on uh, how ladies should behave. What a great warm welcome in Buffalo. Thank you for having me. It is a pleasure to be here at the University of Buffalo. Thank you to YAF for hosting. Thank you to the Logan family, as always, for sponsoring this lecture series. (laughs) And thank you to you. I want to thank, I especially want to thank those people in the audience, because even though they're trying to interrupt the talk, they are showing a lot of bravery for even coming into this auditorium with such an allegedly genocidal maniac. I think it's very impressive. Wait, let's go back to the crowd. Young Americans for Freedom? I see a lot of older folks there. With such an allegedly genocidal maniac. I think it's very impressive. <laughs> Hold on, what, what are you saying? I can't quite make out what you're saying. What is that? Oh, okay, now I got it. Okay. They're saying tra- trans lives matter. Okay, I think I got it. I think... Do you, do you have anything else to say? Do you, just that. Okay. Trans lives matter. Okay. I think I got it. Does anyone have a pen so I can write that down? Okay. Oh, that's a naughty word. Yeah, that's, that's not a word fit for a lady. That's not the way ladies should speak. And I know we're going to be talking about how ladies should speak here tonight. So. All right, good night. Oh, that's, I think fucking profanity is as just as ladylike as it is manlike. Fuck, shout out to those young people who went in there knowing full well they'd be in a room full of people that disagree with them. I don't think that there was any reason for them to believe their uh, lives are in danger from Matt Walsh. But, you know, we saw, we saw during uh, the 2016 election, 
uh, people roughing up protesters at Donald Trump's events. I'm not saying Matt Walsh is Donald Trump. Matt Walsh is not charismatic like Donald Trump. Um, or I'm sorry, that was Michael Knowles, like getting my awful Daily Wire bigots confused. My mistake. Anyway, shout out to them kids. Trans lives do matter. Um, everyone's life matters. It's just that trans lives right now are in extreme danger. And it's spilling over onto what they would call the moderate gays or the cis gays like me, if you could imagine that. Because bigotry hurts everyone. A lot, of sp- a lot of splash damage from bigotry. It doesn't always, doesn't necessarily just hit its intended target, right? So we're a little, we're a little long here, I think, on the show, but we'll run one more clip. Um, this is uh, Michael Knowles on the Charlie Kirk show. And uh, this is, uh, I guess, how they're going to send Michael Knowles off. And this is how I'm going to send all the podcast listeners off, too, because we're going into red light after this. People say, how do we get our country back on all this? You need young, articulate, entrepreneurial truth tellers that are empowered to push the status quo, to push tired old dogma. And you're going to start to see legislative wins and courage happen because of it. I've said this before. The media hates when I say this. Politicians are only reading off the script that we give them. And the script is largely made sense of by articulate you know, podcasters or radio show hosts, Tucker Carlson, Michael Knowles, Candace Owens, Shapiro Walsh. And all of a sudden now Tennessee has accomplished something that would have been a pipe dream a couple years ago. We went from a conservative movement that was afraid to do bathroom bills in Indiana, and North Carolina, to now banning the metacommutilation of children. What changed? What changed is now the people who are processing, no, that are communicating the truth are no longer just the talking heads on TV. There's a new generation of truth tellers and it has liberated the conservative movement michael we're out of time best of luck on your genocidal campaign and <laughs> thank I'm you kidding. Charlie. media Appreciate matters it. i'm kidding i mean you know he thinks it's a joke but that doesn't mean doesn't mean that he agrees with it anyway another show where boy am i glad to be heading on into red light where there just isn't going to be a lot of transphobia which is good Anyway, thanks everybody for tuning into the podcast. Podcast listeners, make sure that you follow us on Twitch, twitch.tv slash Echoplex Media, and uh, go to echoplexmedia.com slash support to find ways to support this project. Um, grateful for all the support we've gotten. Uh, we'd like more, especially the money kind, because then I can do less work during the day and do more stuff to make these shows even better. Um, also on the Plex podcast feed right before this, check out my interview with Fearful Jesuit from Paranoid Strain. That was one of my better interviews. It was recorded this past Thursday. And um, I don't know. i am tell you to have a good week, but I don't know. You probably can't even have a very good day after you listen to that shit. We'll be back with Red Light, everybody.
all the goth DJs and Twitch witches are hanging out on Thursday for the bad VHS rips, unblinking eyes, and fire by night. Thetans and Satans comes from an interest in the cult of Scientology, moral panics, Satanism, and how they set the tone for the extremist social media panics of today. We really earn our weird left Twitch badge with this show, watching the world go red light in reverse every Thursday at 9 p.m. Pacific on twitch.tv slash echoplexmedia. Find our full schedule at echoplexmedia.com.